The Chinese company Betavolt New Energy Technology has unveiled a prototype of a compact atomic battery of a size of 15 millimeters. It is claimed that the device can generate a continuous voltage of 3 volts for 50 years without interruption. However, the battery's power is currently low, around 100 microwatts. Betavolt aims to increase the power to 1 watt soon, which would allow powering small gadgets. A battery that doesn't require charging and doesn't need replacement for decades, and moreover is almost independent of external conditions and the like. It sounds almost too good to be true, and yet it is a very real technology. In general, such power sources were developed as far back as the 1950s. However, there are nuances that currently hinder the widespread adoption of this technology. And in our today's video, we will discuss what atomic batteries technology is, how they are structured, how they generate energy, and so on, as well as the problems that currently prevent atomic batteries from replacing traditional small power sources. Subscribe to the channel, and let's delve into it. The energy source of the atomic battery is the decay energy of a radioactive isotope contained in it, specifically beta decay, where one of the nucleus's neutrons transforms into a proton, ejecting an electron with significant kinetic energy, known as a beta particle. The atomic battery converts the energy of beta particles fast-flying electrons into electricity. There are several possible methods for converting the energy of beta particles into electricity. The most common, including the Chinese battery mentioned, is the beta voltaic effect, a phenomenon of generating an electric current in semiconductor diodes when beta particles pass through them. The beta voltaic effect is analogous to the photovoltaic effect used in solar panels but instead of light photons, electrons are used. To understand how this works, we need to briefly recall what a semiconductor diode is and the processes that occur in it. Pure semiconductors poorly conduct electric current since they lack free charge carriers. For example, in the atom of the most common semiconductor, silicon, there are 14 protons and accordingly 14 electrons, four of which are located on the outer energy level. These electrons are also called valence electrons. All four valence electrons of silicon participate in the formation of a crystalline lattice, pairing with the valence electrons of neighboring atoms, introducing impurities or dopants into the semiconductor's composition can significantly increase its conductivity. For instance, adding phosphorus atoms with 15 protons and electrons, five of which are valence electrons, can enhance the semiconductor's conductivity. Such impurity-induced conductivity is called electron type, and semiconductors exhibiting this property are n-type semiconductors. Alternatively, lighter atoms with fewer protons and electrons than silicon, such as aluminum atoms with three valence electrons, can be introduced into the semiconductor lattice. This creates vacancies that can be filled by electrons from neighboring atoms under the influence of an electric field. The movement of electrons creates positively charged holes, and this mechanism of conductivity is called hole type. Semiconductors exhibiting this property are p-type semiconductors. It's important to note that both n-type and p-type semiconductors overall have a neutral electric charge as the number of protons and electrons remains equal. Now let's take a look at what happens when we combine n-type and p-type semiconductors to create what is called a semiconductor diode. At the boundary of the semiconductors, a layer will form where atoms with extra electrons and atoms with a deficiency of electrons, i.e. atoms with holes, will be adjacent, and the extra electrons can fit into the holes, filling them. In other words, charge carriers of n-type and p-type semiconductors mutually annihilate. Physicists call this recombination. As a result, a zone practically devoid of any charge carriers is formed at the junction of semiconductors, also known as a depleted layer, which poorly conducts electric current. Let's consider the recombination of electrons and holes from an atomic point of view. The extra electron is only extra from the perspective of the crystalline lattice. From the perspective of the atom, it is not extra, and its presence makes the atom electrically neutral. Similarly, the hole is a hole from the perspective of the crystalline lattice, but in terms of the balance of electrons and protons in the atom, everything is in order. In simpler terms, when an electron from n-type semiconductor integrates into a hole in the p-type semiconductor, 
the atom left without an electron becomes positively charged, while the atom that gained an extra electron becomes negatively charged. Overall, the semiconductor sandwich, also called a semiconductor diode, remains electrically neutral, but at the boundary of the depleted layer, zones of excess negative charge from the p-type semiconductor and excess positive charge from the n-type semiconductor are formed. Now, place our semiconductor diode in a stream of beta particles, i.e. electrons with high kinetic energy. Colliding with the lattice atoms, beta particles will be able to knock out electrons from them, creating electron-hole pairs. Under the influence of the electric field between the oppositely charged edges of the depleted layer, both the electron and the hole will start moving. The electron will be drawn into the N region and the hole into the P region. In other words, a negative charge will accumulate inside the N-type semiconductor and a positive charge inside the P-type semiconductor. If we now connect the opposite ends of the semiconductor diode with a conductor, an electric current will flow through this conductor. The occurrence of this current is called the beta voltaic effect. The principle is essentially the same in solar panels, but there, the generation of electron hole pairs occurs due to the collision of photons of electromagnetic radiation with the diode material, and the corresponding effect is called the photovoltaic effect. If a photovoltaic cell needs sunlight to function, a beta voltaic cell does not. It is sufficient to place a piece of material undergoing beta decay next to the cell, and the device will generate an electric current. It's worth noting that beta radioactive substances can serve as a source of energy for beta voltaic cells for very long periods. For example, potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.2 billion years. In other words, beta voltaic cells can become almost eternal. Within the time frame of human life, or even the entire lifespan of humanity, as an energy source that practically requires no maintenance. Plug it in and forget about it. However, in practice, things are a bit more complicated. First of all, as always when dealing with something radioactive, radiation safety needs to be considered. In simpler terms, the radiation required for the battery's operation must stay inside the battery and not escape. This means that the beta particles emitted should not have too much kinetic energy to lose it completely when passing through the battery material. Moreover, in many cases, beta decay is accompanied by the release of X-ray and gamma radiation, which has much greater penetrating power, and the battery casing may not contain it. For this reason, the previously mentioned potassium-40 is not suitable for use as the filling for an atomic battery as a significant portion of the energy released during the decay of potassium-40 is in the form of gamma rays, and such a battery would emit noticeable radiation. Finally, if we want to obtain a truly long-lasting power source, we need to use isotopes with a sufficiently long half-life, and it is highly desirable for the decay of this isotope to result in a stable, non-radioactive substance. After all, we don't want to exacerbate the already challenging issue of radioactive waste. In summary, for an atomic battery, we need a clean source of soft beta radiation with a long half-life and, at the same time, providing significant energy release per unit time from unit volume, as otherwise, our battery will simply not deliver an acceptable power output, especially considering that beta voltaic cells typically convert only a few percent of the total energy released during decay into electrical energy. As a result, the choice of suitable isotopes turns out to be not as extensive as one might think. For example, tritium, a relatively convenient isotope from the radiation safety standpoint, is a heavy isotope of hydrogen with one proton and two neutrons in its nucleus. Undergoing beta decay to helium-3, it releases only 2.5 millionths of a watt per cubic centimeter in gaseous form. By incorporating tritium into various chemical compounds, mostly metal hydrides, one can achieve a denser packing of atoms and increase energy output. However, considering the low efficiency of beta voltaic cells, the overall power of tritium batteries remains negligible. Modern tritium batteries, prototypes of which are presented in Russia and the USA, can only deliver a few microwatts or millionths of a watt. Such devices are suitable for powering very low power devices like various sensors, explaining their limited widespread adoption. 
Greater power can be achieved by using more energy-dense beta radioactive isotopes, with nickel-63 being one of the most popular. It has an impressive half-life of 96 years, transforms into stable copper-63 upon decay, and most importantly, generates 0.54 watts per cubic centimeter of material. This is the nickel-63 filling used in beta-volt batteries, allowing them to achieve a relatively high power output of 100 microwatts for atomic batteries. However, nickel-63 has several significant drawbacks. It is not naturally occurring and must be artificially created by irradiating natural nickel-62 with neutron fluxes. The resulting substance is a mixture of various nickel isotopes, and extracting pure, or at least relatively pure, nickel-63 poses a significant challenge. Currently, most producers enrich nickel to 20%, automatically increasing the required mass of the filling by a factor of five to achieve the same power output. Moreover, the final cost of the filling becomes quite high, around $4,000 to $5,000 per gram. Therefore, the cost of a high-power nickel battery would be tens of thousands of dollars, and such devices are unlikely to be in demand purely from a commercial perspective, despite their merits. This is why nickel atomic batteries developed in Russia, the USA, Germany, and other countries have not gained widespread adoption, and the beta volt development is unlikely to hit the mass market anytime soon for the same reasons. However, this does not mean that atomic batteries are not worth exploring. Today, they can find applications in certain niche industries. For example, they can be equipped in spacecraft, sensors on various automated stations located in hard to reach places, especially underground or underwater. They can also find use in medicine, such as power sources for pacemakers or other implanted devices. Furthermore, ongoing efforts in many countries aim to improve, reduce costs, and increase the power of beta-voltaic elements. Firstly, experiments are being conducted with other beta-radioactive isotopes, such as strontium-90 or cesium-137. For instance, the energy release of promethium-147 reaches 1 watt per cubic centimeter, twice that of nickel-63. However, promethium-147 has a relatively short half-life of just over 2.5 years, making promethium batteries far from eternal. Even higher energy output is provided by cadmium-113 meme, up to 2.3 watts per cubic centimeter with a half-life of 14 years. Secondly, efforts are being made to improve the efficiency of beta-voltaic converters. After all, the efficiency of photovoltaic elements, or solar panels, was once only about 1%, but today it has been increased to 20%. For example, there is active development of so-called three-dimensional beta-voltaic elements, where the substance, both the radioisotope and semiconductors, is represented not as plates, but as more complex volumetric structures. This can increase conversion efficiency and reduce the device's size while maintaining the same power. Experiments are also conducted with various semiconductor materials. For example, the American company City Labs claims to have achieved a 7.5% efficiency of a beta-voltaic element using gallium-indium-phosphide semiconductors. Beta-volt, on the other hand, is betting on carbon-based semiconductors, which marketers and journalists have already dubbed diamond semiconductors. Carbon semiconductors are currently at the forefront of semiconductor technology, and it might be worth exploring them in more detail in a separate video. By the way, regarding carbon, a couple of years ago, there was quite a buzz about so-called diamond atomic batteries, where carbon was planned to be used both as a material for the beta-voltaic element and as the radioactive filling. More precisely, these batteries were proposed to be charged with radioactive carbon-14, which, by the way, is a fairly common component of nuclear industry waste. The idea was to combine radioactive carbon-14 and carbon semiconductor into a single device, aiming to achieve relatively high efficiency. The concept was almost simultaneously introduced by the American company NDB Incorporated and the National Institute for Materials Science in Japan. The technology is intriguing, partly due to the relative cheapness of carbon-14. However, it has one major drawback, the relatively low radioactivity of this isotope. The Americans from NDB claim to achieve an energy conversion efficiency of up to 40%, allowing the creation of a battery with a power output of the same 100 microwatts. 
Yet, such super-optimistic figures immediately raise doubts among experts. And judging by the fact that over the years, neither NDB nor the Japanese have reported anything fundamentally new, those doubts seem to have been justified. Finally, it is worth noting that beta voltaics is not the only method of converting the energy of radioactive decay, including beta decay, into electricity. It is entirely possible that what the creators of beta voltaic atomic batteries couldn't achieve might be accomplished by their colleagues in related fields, which we will definitely discuss in one of our upcoming videos. And with that, thank you all, best wishes, and until our next encounter.